So the investigation in the 1955 murder of Emmett Till is officially closed. The DOJ opened its investigation after the woman who accused Till recanted her story to a professor in 2017. But the DOJ, DOJ says it cannot prove the woman lied to federal <laughs> investigators, even though she said she did. Okay, interesting. Uh, Till uh, was visiting family in Mississippi uh, when a white woman accused the 14-year-old of pro propositioning her. Two white men later abducted and beat the teenager to death. Uh, Oh, my goodness. I don't even know where to start with this. Uh, <laughs> whew, Dr. Ome Congo, um, like I said, I don't even know where to start with this. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts about the fact that uh, here we are, they're finally closing the case that they didn't close because the person who lied, because mm -hmm. she said that she lied, so I'm just going to take her at a word at this point, that she actually lied. Yep. But now they're saying they yep. don't know that she lied. I mean, what in the world is going on uh, at the Department of Justice? You know, it, it, it's like people just continually want to just spit on Emmett Till's grave and, and the grave of his whole family, Mamie Till and, and everybody else. And it's just completely disrespectful. She came out and said that she lied. When I listen to stories of people like Joe Madison and the like, and people who lived during that time and how shocking it was um, to and change their whole psyche and how we've had the Trayvon Martins of the world and the Michael Browns reminiscent of Emmett Till. And you see, even up until today, the woman can come out and confess to the truth and still can't get this justice. This woman's lies killed him, and now her truth is killing him further. And it's really, it's really frustrating, and, and I'm happy that so many of us are upholding his memory, but I, it just continually see, see, seems to me, and I think every single year when they fixed his memorial, people drive by and shoot at it to such an extent that they had to put a bulletproof barrier around it. People keep continuing to bury this man, and we have to make sure that we, well, young boy at the time, and we have to continue to make sure that we are uplifting him because the DOJ, Carolyn Bryant, and all of these guys continue to just spit on his grave. And, and we can't have it. I completely agree with you. Uh, uh, Dr. Malvo, honestly, wh what can we glean from this about American culture? I mean, here is this, you know, the, the issue that led to this child's death. And I just want to reiterate that again, as, as you so rightly did, uh, Dr. Omi Congo, child murdered, okay? The issue that led to his death was the so-called, you know, privileging and protection of the dainty white woman. And here we are, uh, decades later, and this not-so-dainty white woman came out and, and finally admitted, I don't know what was going on, maybe she thought she was about to kick the buck and she wanted to, you know, confess her sins, saying here that, okay, actually, what I said happened never happened. And they killed that child for no reason. And now the Department of Justice is saying, well, we can't really prove that she lied. What does that tell us? I mean, to me, it seems like it's saying something about how, you know, white privilege has no freaking bounds because what it is doing is suggesting that white people maybe can't be that bad, but really all evidence <laughs> suggests that they can. You know, Avis, the last time I actually broke down in public, um, and I don't do that very often, as you know, was when I was at the National African American Museum and I looked at the Emmett Till casket. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of being a little girl um, and having my mom show me the picture in ebony and saying to my brother, be careful of white women. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I'll never forget, be careful of white women. And the fact is that we all do this kumbaya BS, but when a white woman clutches her pearls and says that a black man has been out of order, he has been signed up for a lynching. We and, and and the lie, see, the part of this, Avis, that I have to just go into um, is the lie about white female fragility. Yes. Most black men were lynched because they had too much, not because they mm. were raping white women, but because they had too much. Mm. Now, in the Emmett Till case, I mean, and I can give you, you, you know me, I can give you line, chapter, and verse, Tulsa, Wilmington, North Carolina, um, so many black men who just accumulated even a little bit 
and their little bit was threatening the white people. So they were lynched yes. because they had. And so this is where we are again. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, the whole thing with Emmett Till is about a putrid, P-U-T-R-I-D, putrid white woman mm. who sat in her whatever she thought she was in and accused a child. And let's say get a child. They said he was reckless eyeballing. He was a kid. He didn't know what he was doing. If he did reckless eyeball, which he probably didn't, this was an insecure, ugly ass, and I'm going to say it, and you know, I try not to curse on the air, ugly ass white woman who was trying to incite her husband. And all too often that happened. Ida B. Wells documented a lynching that I was talking about just the other day. It was a lynching that happened... Um, when a itinerant black man kind of walked the road, you know, he walked the road and he fixed people's fences and he did whatever. He hooked up with or met a white woman who was a widow, theoretically attractive. I've never seen really an attractive white woman, but they said she was. And so anyway, they hooked up. He was helping her with her house. They began a sexual relationship. White people were mad because this woman had property. And she's like, why is she laying up with his brother? They busted into her house one night to find them in bed. She initially cried rape. Mm -hmm. They had had a consensual relationship for months, but she cried rape. They took him and they tied him to a tree. They went to burn him. This is what we also don't understand about lynchings. Burnings occurred as well. When they gave her the match to light... Oh he said to her, honey, would you do this to me after all I've been to you? And you know what? The itch lit the match. And so this is our history. And this is why, for so many reasons, it's so challenging for black and white women to work together. Because we know that when you're behind lies, my brother is going to go hanging off a tree. And mm. that is the Emmett Till story. How dare anyone shoot there? But they're going to do that because what is America is racism is baked in the cake we call America. It's all up in there. You, can, you can't slice it out like you slice out a little piece and say, okay, we're going to take this piece out because it's all up in there. It's like cinnamon is in applesauce. It's just up in there. And we have to consistently resist this notion. And forgive me for going on so long, but, you know, the whole... Emmett Till story um, reduces me to pudding. Well, Makes me feel so... Um, I don't even have the word, Avis. It just makes me feel so angry, but also, at some point, so empowered. Because we ain't gonna let this spit go down. We ain't gonna let the spit go down. So we will keep fighting. Absolutely, we'll keep fighting. But, you know, I, I definitely feel and understand your anger. Uh, the reality is that how can... You know, we're not that far from this moment. This is not mm -hmm. ancient history yeah. as much as people like to act like it is. Uh, neither is it ancient history just in terms of timetable. But I would argue it's not an ancient history in, in, in regards to actually what happens in present day oftentimes based on um, statements that aren't true. Uh, based on just a culture that tends to prioritize uh, and elevate uh, white womanhood and all instantly consider black males to be uh, inherently criminal and how that leads to situation that causes the deaths of black men uh, at the drop of a hat. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Ole Congo, um, what do you think about this challenge that we continue to wrestle with. I mean, honestly, I don't like to throw up my hands with anything, and I know that we've made some progress, but it's certainly very discouraging to see this as something that's completely embedded in American culture. And how do you uh, move past this cultural challenge that I think goes well beyond any sort of legal remedies. This is just who, mm -hmm. what, who and what America is, is it not? Absolutely. I believe it was Julian Bond who said uh, America literally spells out if you just switch the words around to I am race, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's been the basis of, of who we've been from the beginning. And the way to get around it is uh, I, I 
is two words, on blast. We have to continue to put people on blast. I, I believe it was Johnny Cochran who said, you hit people in their pocketbooks and their hearts will follow. All of the hashtagging. This is what led to the wild black hashtagging trend that happened over the last two years or so. Putting people on blast, letting companies see their employees act up. This has led to people getting fired. This has led to people getting reprimanded. This has led to people getting arrested. And again, we're not calling for violence on violence, but when, uh, when we see these people in the streets and they're getting recorded and it's making it back to their companies and they're losing their jobs, these are the types of punishments that we need to uh, ca call them out for. Because, and really, at the end of the day, I've seen some of these videos where some of the black folks who are in them, they, they mad and they are starting to retaliate violently as well. So people need to be on notice for that because we don't come don't any of that. So at the end of the day, we need to continue to use our platforms to call these people out. We're running these social medias in terms of hashtagging, and, and, and we have these platforms out there using it, letting people know that we are not tolerating it anymore. I, I mean, I'm just imagining what if we had, you know, the social media back in those days and what we could have done to help expose women like Brian and all of these other people who are lying out there. What could the consequences have been? So I think that that's what we need to be doing. We need to continue doing it. And it kind of ties into the other segment, showing people that our lives matter. You're not just going to lie on us for sitting in our car, for working at an ATM machine, for selling lemonade, for selling Girl Scout cookies, for just walking down the street, all of this other type of stuff. We are going to show you that our lives matter. It may cost you your job. It may cost you some other type of, of thing that you love. But we are going to let you know one way or another that this is going to stop. Absolutely. And, and, and I wonder if, you know, with all of the sort of Karenisms that you, that you just kind of <laughs> laid out there, you know, I think about there are just so many dangers from the, 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 the noisy, annoying Karens to literal life or death issues. I'm thinking about it just came back from Miami with my oldest son who wanted to go to Art Basel for a minute. We went out there and he wanted to hang out uh, that evening. And, and I told him, I was like, OK, hang out. He's he's grown man, 25, but I'm like, mm -hmm. be careful. This is Florida. We're not home. Trayvon Martin, mm -hmm. Jordan Davis, uh, you know, there are folks around here who will just shoot you and just ordinary citizens, not even policemen, yeah. right? So, you know, my thought to, to you, Dr. Malvo, how do we keep our our, our children safe, our, our loved ones safe, ourselves safe, navigating a society where it seems like in many instances, it kind of, uh, you know, gives people the, definitely, not even kind of, it gives people the feeling that they are empowered to literally take black people's lives uh, at the drop of a hat. Well, it, they're empowered to kill. Those people who shot down Ahmaud Arbery, they were empowered to kill. They thought they could do that. They were checked. But, you know, Oma Congo, I have to say, you raise a point about what if we had social media back in the day. There are three reasons why social media back in the day wouldn't work then and doesn't always work now. Number one, you have a bunch of wuss black people. I'm just going to put it out there. Folks who, mm -hmm. well, maybe they should have, they shouldn't have been walking there. So that's wuss black people, number one. Number two, this stuff is not individually isolated. It is structural. If it were individually mm -hmm. isolated, we get upset about a Trayvon Martin, about a George Floyd, about an Abed Aubrey, about a Breonna Taylor. That is individual isolation. The issue is a structural way that black people can be demonized and victimized every time we do something. Inhale, walk down the street, use an ATM, uh, say something to somebody. You know, um, mm -hmm. it is amazing. So we got the wuss black people. We got the structuralism. And the third thing we have is white indifference. Mm -hmm. There is an indifference to our lives. I have started, which is a very bad habit, a reading uh, comments on various stories in the Washington Post. It's a very bad habit because mm -hmm. I spend too much time. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, like, going back at stupid white folks saying, have you lost your mind? your racism is showing, or something like that. But the fact is that there are some myopic white people who believe that we deserve this. And we have to go all the way back to when we got here and how we were dehumanized, demonized, made to seem threatening. This is how we ended up with the prison industrial complex to ensure that black men especially, but also black women, were free labor 
for this predatory capitalist system, we have to basically deal with that. And unfortunately, we are in the minority. Avis, earlier you talked about uh, the majority of the minority. But the fact is that our country was never designed for the majority to be able to vote, to have power. It was always designed, when you have look at the way the Senate is constructed, that uh, Vermont has the same number of senators as California, which has mm -hmm. 10 times the population. It was always designed to be minority, predatory, capitalist rule. Mm -hmm. We need a revolution. At the end of the day, we just need to turn this you-know-what out. And that's back in the day what we tried to do, and folks were like, oh, no, calm down. It's all going to be okay. No, it ain't okay. It won't be up okay until we make it so. I hear you, my girl. All right, folks, back to our my unfiltered video in just one moment. Oh, that spin class was brutal. Well, you can try using the Buick's massaging seat. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Can I use Apple CarPlay to put some music on? Sure. It's wireless. Pick something we all like. Okay, hold on. What's your Buick's Wi-Fi password? Buick Envision 2021. Oh, you should pick something stronger. That's really predictable. That's a really tight spot. Don't worry. I used to hate parallel parking. Me, Me too. too. Hey. You really outdid yourself. Yes, we did. The all-new Buick Envision. An SUV built around you. All of you. Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real um, revolutionary right now. Black Power. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. I love y'all. All momentum we have now. We have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?